the author and his book and everything else put together. So um, we are here to talk about Manu Pillai's latest book. If you haven't read it, do give it a read. In my uh, very, very busy schedule, I have made it a point to give it a read, and it was a delightful read. It's called False Allies. That's what the book is called. And um, more as we go along about the book. A little bit about the book, Manu, before we start off, because I wouldn't take it for granted that everyone sitting here would have already read the book. So it'll be nice if you just give us a brief introduction about the book, and then we'll carry on from there. You know, uh, many years ago, I was reading Freedom at Midnight, which is a very well-known book. And it has this section on the Maharajas, rather a chapter on the integration of the Indian states. And it talks about the Rajas as these very colorful figures who, in the morning, they woke up, they oppressed many people. Then they watched their dancing girls. Then they sort of conspired with the British to keep India under the Raj. And then in the evening, they oppressed some more people. That's how the Rajas were gen generally constructed. There were these idiosyncrasies that were highlighted. There was this one Maharaja who had so many women in his harem that instead of, like the Nizam was called his exalted highness, this man was called his exhausted highness because he had so many ladies in his harem. Uh, so those are the sort of very colorful, titillating stories that, that moved about on the Maharajas. But the fact is that in Kerala, my grandmother grew up in a princely state. And the world she described to me was not at all like this. You know, they had a government school, there were medical facilities, uh, there was uh, milk powder that came to the school uh, for all the kids and so on. And it was just life as normal. You know, it wasn't like the Raja was some strange, mysterious figure. And I did my first book, which was on Travancore, uh, a 700-pager. And those 700 pages taught me that there is something to the princely states and princely India that is more than the stereotype. And to me, the question is, if the stereotype of dancing girls, elephants, palaces exists, the question is to ask why that stereotype exists, rather than accepting the stereotype and saying that this is what princely India was all about. But more importantly, when we speak of modern Indian history, the princely states covered 40% of the Indian subcontinent. We are so fixated with what happened in British-ruled India that we've forgotten political processes that happened in Indian-ruled India. The princely states were also Indians with Indian bureaucrats, with Indian ministers governing other Indians. Of course, the British were on top of them, but even so, it was the Raja who was very much the face of power in, these, in the 40% uh, of, of the Indian subcontinent. So any understanding of modern Indian history is, I think, handicapped without uh, bringing on board the, Hin the Indian princely states, which is why I decided to do this book, where I use uh, Ravi Varma as a connecting thread, because he traveled and painted multiple Maharajas in different parts of the country. And I thought that you know that's one good way by which I don't have to select states. I follow the painter. Whichever state he goes to, I try and research that and uncover what was happening there. And yes, the, the picture that emerges is very much the opposite of the stereotype, even though you can see why the stereotype exists. Um, I couldn't agree more because, you know, being in, uh, being, having taught history for so long, I mean, this is uh, something that all uh, teachers of history come across when we are trying to, you know, build this interest in students because I'm sure you'll agree with me when I tell you so, that when we are teaching history in the classroom, firstly, we have to battle going beyond textbooks which are terrifying and terrible. And the other thought is that, uh, you know, uh, it's always taught in a unilinear, unidimensional manner. And uh, very, very, I don't know, sensibly or according to the authors, what you mentioned is that we hardly find any reference to these princely states who actually covered more than 40% of the Indian subcontinent. And that's why, strangely enough, you know, those of us who are not really that steeped in the subject never end up knowing very much, which is indeed very sad because even if we knew the colorful bit, I mean, we would know something. But I'm so glad that, you know, you've uh, made this effort. And, uh, you know, I have to commend you about this because when I was reading it, what was so fascinating was the fact that you chose Raja Ravi Varma's paintings, which you just mentioned. Usually people wouldn't think of that, you know, that someone would, you know, sort of go and decide to go to the libraries and research and look at references or sources, primarily literary or otherwise. But the fact that, you know, you say this so beautifully that you decided to follow the painter. 
because uh, as we all know that Raja Ravi Varma happens to be one of the most uh, acclaimed and celebrated painters of modern India. But when we speak of Raja Ravi Varma, even now, you know, and I'm talking to the Instagram gener you know, generation, you will find, I, I follow uh, Radhika Raji. She is one of the princesses. And in their palace, you will see that there are a lot of Raja Ravi Varma paintings. But the bulk of that happens to depict deities. And there are very few of the erstwhile Raja, etc. But while reading your book and looking at the different chapters, it was so fascinating to see that here was this man who was actually an outsider, who became an insider. And I want you to elaborate on that a bit and how that reflected on, you know, his study of the paintings of these different princes that he worked on. Well, to begin with, what is a painting, right? We sometimes make the mistake of thinking that when a Raja is painted, it's just about the Raja's likeness, that the painter is just depicting how the Raja looks. But in reality, a, a, a portrait by, say, an artist like Ravi Varma or any, any other portraitist, it's also a political statement. So, you know, one example I typically give is in the book, there's a, a painting of the Pudukote Raja. Pudukote was this state in Tamil Nadu, it's a relatively small state, just over 1,000 square miles. It was ruled by kings of the Kallar caste. And Kallars, the British used to class them as criminal tribe. So you have a Raja who's of this so-called criminal tribe. And it's interesting, he was actually a very weak ruler. You know, he was completely unable to manage his state, etc. And the British had to interfere and so on. But what's interesting is if you look at the Ravi Varma portrait of the man, you see that this is a projection of the Raja's self-image. He stands with great confidence in this painting. He's wearing this very fine achkan. And in the background, there's a temple gopuram, which is supposed to represent continuity. The gopuram represents the past, the Raja's connection to history, his connection to heritage, and his, and his, possession, his position as a custodian of, of tradition and culture. But his hand rests on an English book. You can see the spine is turned to the viewer, and it's an English book by which the Raja is also signaling that I am a man of the modern world. The British cannot turn me into an exotic creature who doesn't belong in this world, some kind of anachronism, you know. I am very much a man of the modern world. I am able to negotiate what the Gopuram represents, and I am also able to negotiate what modernity represents. So that single painting communicates the Raja's self-image. When women are painted by Ravi Varma again, you'll see that they have books in the painting, such as uh, Europe Visited, you know, things that Indian women were not able to do physically in those days, but through books they were making a claim to having that kind of knowledge. So painting in itself is not about the likeness, it's about what the painting is trying to communicate. And Ravi Varma, as you said, you know, he's this interesting character who's born in a princely state. He's, he's got relatives who are royalty, his sisters-in-law, his granddaughters, uh, they both become the Maharanis of Travancore. Then he travels to different places and becomes a, a very well-regarded society painter. This was a time when art and painting was seen very much as a low-caste slash low-class profession, which is that you were treated as a craftsman. So in Udaipur, there was a painter called Kundan Lal who had gone to the Slade School of Art in London, but he was paid 30 rupees a month and treated as a relatively lowly I mean, he was an employee he who was, was just employee. there. But when a Ravi Varma went there, because of his social background, because of his reputation, because he had these network, networking skills and charisma, he was received with p necklaces of pearls, robes of honor, sometimes elephants and so on. So he's also an interesting way to enter princely India because not only is he depicting princely India, they saw him very much as somebody who would help them, the Rajas that is, construct their image in the colonial period. That's why I thought Ravi Varma was a very fitting uh, thread to put uh, through the book connecting all the chapters. Uh, another observation, I mean, linking it to the paintings particularly, uh, you know, this uh, reference that you make about the connection between the past and the present. And um, I want you to comment on this, that do you feel that somewhere these Indian princes, when they were commissioning Ravi Verma as the one who would do their portraits and uh, as you said, every portrait, and there's such a lovely collection in your book, each one tells a story, if you look at it very, very closely. So do you want, I mean, do you feel that they were actually trying to send across a very strong message through these portraits that they were commissioning to the Raj? They were very much, because you see, one of the reasons the stereotype exists, which is that the Rajas were good for nothing, they only cared about money, they only cared about drinking, they only cared about dancing girls, and maybe once in a while they got out and rode elephants. 
the, st the, the stereotype exists because how do the British justify their presence in India? They claim we are in India to civilize India, which means that any Indian who actually has political power has to be demeaned and reduced to some kind of a cliche because otherwise, if Indians can prove that they are able to govern themselves, then the British lose their locus standi for being in India. And that's what the Rajas did. You know, for example, there was a Maharaja of Travancore. All these Rajas were expected to deck themselves with their ornaments and so on. And the British used to force them at some of these public darbars. They would insist that the Rajas come wearing diamonds and this, that. And the Rajas often hated it because they knew they were being trotted out as these exotic beings, whereas in reality, they enjoyed they, they would make a statement by wearing simple clothes. So there's this one Raja in Travancore where a visitor comes and says that he looks like he's bought his clothes at a, at a local tailor's shop. And, but that's a conscious decision the Raja has taken because he will not allow the British to turn him into an exhibit, somebody who's effeminate, somebody who's not capable of ex exercising power, somebody who's not some kind of man of action. So because then, then that would give them this kind of an excuse to want to correct. usurp them and take yeah. over the state. And make them look like idiots, essentially. And another thing, I'm just bringing it in because you're commenting on the princes and this thing of keeping it simple. I mean, that was a statement they're making. Don't you think that that also, in a way, helped those princes to connect better to the general people in their kingdoms, where, you know, maybe they were far better connected than the British Raj? In fact, there's a study by a scholar called Ian Copeland, and he actually makes the point that, you know, a lot of these Hindu Maharajas, they were officially custodians of the faith, protectors of temples, religions, and so on. But if you look at communal violence in India, it was higher in British-ruled India than in princely India. Instances of communal violence were lower in the princely states versus British India, as per uh, Ian Copeland's research, which is an interesting question, right? If the Rajas were custodians of the Hindu faith and so on, why is it that that kind of aggressive uh, violence did not break out that often in the princely states because the Rajas had a kind of moral authority to sit down people and say, look, you're arguing, here's a solution, I have the cultural authority to give you a solution, and everybody accepts it. A British collector, a white man coming, he's much more clinical. So when violence breaks out, he'll come with the police to break up the violence, but he doesn't have the moral legitimacy to... Uh, prevent that from happening in the first place. And that's the other thing I communicate in the book, right? We assume that the nationalists and the Rajas hated each other. The Congress and the Rajas were opposite ends of the, of the political spectrum. The fact of the matter is that's not true. Till the 1930s, even Gandhiji was very, very respectful of the Rajas. Many Rajas were seen as icons uh, for Indians because in the late 19th century, Indians did not go beyond certain positions in the British service. At best, you could be a glorified secretary to some white man. That's all you could be. But in the princely states, you could go on to be a divan, you could be a minister, you could actually govern. And because these Indians were aware of it, they often tried to improve the princely states and make standards of living better than British India in the princely states. So nationalists felt a sense of pride because by pointing to princely states, they could tell the British, we don't need you to govern. Look at the princely states, they're doing perfectly well uh, without British And you know, considering these Rajas, they themselves were so rich. Uh, as far as we see, you know, when we are looking at the early Congress, and uh, many of these Rajas happened to be patrons of, uh, you know, a lot of the congressmen, and they were willingly part of this. So, you know, when I was reading your book, and it comes across so in such an interesting manner, that here were these Rajas who were giving in to a bit of ritualism, and yes, respecting the British Raj, and paying, making it a point to pay their revenue on time, and yet there is this other side of them which is not so respectful, and they sort of are independent in their views, and they are doing their own thing. So that is very fascinating. Comment on that, please. You see, that's the thing. You know, we imagine that ritual was some kind of empty, you know, empty-headed thing that these rajas did when they insisted on certain ceremonies being carried out and so on. I'll give you an example. In multiple princely states, the British resident, who's like the British agent at the court of the Maharaja, would insist on entering the darbar with his shoes on. And the rajas would say, no, nobody enters the darbar with the shoes on. If you enter, it demeans my status. In a state like Hyderabad, it took two or three generations for the British to finally win the right to wear shoes. The first two Nizams, in the first two generations did not agree. 
finally, in the third generation, there was a little boy on the throne. Obviously, he didn't have much of a say in the matter, so the British finally started wearing shoes in the darbars. Sometimes, similarly, the British would say that, oh, you know, the chair of the resident cannot be kept on the left side of the darbar. It has to be on the right side, because the right side is more honorable. And the Raja would say, no, the left side is where the chair has always been. It has to stay there. And they would fight over the chair. Now, on the one hand, if you look at it, it's comical. Why are these people fighting over a chair? But the chair actually represents something political. If the Raja accepts the order to move the chair from left to right, he's bowing his head, he loses self-respect in his own kingdom. You know, so the chair represents politics. Ritual is another platform on which politics is conducted by the British and by the Rajas. That's why the British insist, you know, when the Queen and King of England came in 1911, they wanted the Rajas to line up, they had to come up and bow some three times to the, the King of King, Queen of England and so on. And one Raja who didn't do it, Sayajirao Gaikwad of Baroda, was threatened with deposition because he went up. Firstly, he wasn't wearing any diamonds, wasn't looking exotic. The story goes he went swinging his cane, sort of tilted his head briefly, turned around, showed the king and queen his back, and then walked off. And that became this big hoo-ha that the British made. The other thing is there were also ways to subvert the British very creatively. You mentioned revenues, right? So a lot of these Rajas had to pay tribute to the British. Now, the Jaipur Maharaja had a clause in his treaty that any amount over 40 lakh rupees, you had to, you'd, he'd have to give a cut to the British government. He started fudging his accounts. You know, he simply, he had everything modern in terms of, uh, he, he started a girl's school, a hospital, a college, uh, gas lamps in the streets, all of that in Jaipur was there. But he did not modernize revenue administration deliberately because he wanted control over how much of the accounts the British could see. So year after year after year, for some 20, 30 years, his revenue was always 39 lakhs, 38 lakhs, 38.5 lakhs. It never crossed 40. But the British knew. They knew in reality the Raja had nearly 60 lakhs in revenue. He was just playing a game with them and, and preventing this from happening. Uh, there was another guy called Tukujira Holkar in Indore wrote this one letter to the British saying that, oh, you know, India was just a heap of stones till the British came, and the British have built it into this wonderful edifice. So on the face of it, a very groveling, a very slavish kind of Raja, very much in cahoots with the British. But if you look at the private records of the British government internally on the same Maharaja, they call him notoriously disloyal. They say that he's a man who constantly rakes up trouble for the British. Because what he says is, I'm willing to say these oily things and bow down to you outside my state, so long as you don't come and interfere within my state. So this gentleman, for example, even as he's writing slavish letters to the British, he's also giving large grants to Dadabai Nauroji's East India Association in London, which is fighting the British right under the Queen's nose in London. Assorted Maharajas, they've been told repeatedly not to fund, fund the Congress party. They keep giving money to the Congress party. They keep giving money to local organizations like the Pune Sarvajanik Sabha, which is a regional club. They give money to the Deccan Education Society, which runs the Ferguson College in Pune, which is where a bunch of revolutionaries went and studied. So the British knew that the Rajas were playing essentially a double game. And somebody like Sayajurao Gaikwad of Baroda, he funds the Congress. He funds Dadabai Nauroji's election to the House of Commons in London. He, whenever he travels, he meets people like Shamji Krishnavarma, Bhikaji, Madam Kama, you know, all kinds of revolutionaries. He's got links to the Savarkar brothers. And yet, when the British come and speak to him, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm very loyal to you and so on. But they know. You know, at one point, this Raja was found that a lot of anti-British propaganda was being printed in Baroda state under very innocent titles like vegetable medicines. So you look at the book, it says, ah, vegetable medicines. You open the book and you see it's actually a bomb manual. You know, the, the Raja allows uh, his state to basically be used as a platform against the British. Some of it is, is, is quite funny also, you know, and a previous Baroda Raja had this habit where dacoits from Baroda would go out, attack British districts, and the British Bombay police, for example, would chase the dacoits, and they would cross over back into Baroda. The problem was the Bombay police could not follow them into Baroda. You know, because it was a different jurisdiction. So the dacoits would go in, and the Raja, every now and then, the British would pressure him, he would catch one catch two, hand them over, but secretly he would allow the dacoits to keep plundering British territories because he thought, why not? You know, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So there's always more than what meets the eye as far as a lot of these rajas are concerned. One big, one big mechanism that they followed was just having super strong administrations. You know, states in South India like Mysore, Travancore, they actively modernized their governments precisely because they did not want to give the British an excuse to come and interfere in their states. So the British would say, oh, you Indians, you can't govern yourselves. We are here to teach you. But here you have the Maharaj of Mysore who's setting up the Indian Institute of Science, Iron and Steel Works, the biggest, big, one of the biggest dams in, in, in the world at the time. He's making a political statement back to the British saying that actually science and technology, we have a claim on it as well, not just you. So, you know, it, 
this is why there's this wonderful overlap between the Congress and the Rajas till the 1930s. Of course, in the 1930s, the equation changes, but till then, it's, it's a fascinating story. Uh, we'll story. come to that in a bit. But, you know, the, again, I'm going back to the same point that, uh, and strangely enough, you know, like we have this in the history of the Congress, I mean, if we are charting that, you will see that, uh, you know, primarily we give a lot of focus and to whatever's happening in the northern part of the subcontinent. And um, strangely enough, I mean, considering South India is so very rich and there's so much happening there, I mean, there's this strange divide. And uh, again, I'm going back to that. I mean, hardly is that given any place in the curriculum. You know, and a lot of, uh, so much of richness of the culture that exists goes unknown for the bulk of the country, which is worrisome because, you know, I think we, are, we as students of history, we are standing at a very, very important crossroad as we talk because at, at the, on the one hand, we are trying desperately to not enable the decimation of our past and the recreation to convenience of the past for the future generations. And I think a lot of that, you know, the responsibility will lie in the hands of young writers like you to be able to present the real picture uh, and culled from proper sources, which I think our future Indians should know about. And, uh, you know, that's, I think that's very, very important for us as students of our past. And here is where, you know, I want to bring in this that, you know, it's interesting, as you said, we are looking at it in two phases. There's this phase from about 1885 to the 1930s, where the relationship between the members of the Congress and the Rajas, as we say, is very, very uh, friendly. And they, they are on very good terms. They're very close. There's a lot of funding that's coming in for the congressmen. And the equations, sadly enough, would start changing as our national narrative starts changing. Because by the 1930s, what is slowly, I and mean, gradually, it's becoming clear to us that the days of the British in India are numbered. And then, I mean, we have to draw new equations about how things will change and how independent India will be looked at. And then, what will be the role of these princely states, the 100 plus that we have in this new narrative that will be written primarily by the Indian National Congress. And, uh, you know, then that was just the Muslim League and the Congress and things had more or less become clear that, you know, there would be the, you know, a divide of the subcontinent, which many people were, you know, drastically against. But as it was becoming clearer that that is what is to come, what would be the future of these Indian Rajas? Because, you know, where, what we've already seen, where these Indian Rajas are concerned, they have been people with their own independent voices. They have been sensible individuals who have known how to play this game of checks and balances very carefully. And they have kept themselves afloat. And primarily what was so enjoyable when I was reading your book is the fact that, you know, uh, here were these rulers who genuinely cared for the people in this state, which may not have been the case when it comes to the British officials, because we know that the British used to ostracize people so much. So comment now, Manu, on how this narrative would change between 1930 and independence and a few years thereafter. Well, firstly, the Rajas were political actors. You know, as I said, if we think of them as characters in a costume drama, that's a very limited way of looking at them. They operated in a world where, for example, if you take a Rajput state, you have pressure from the British on the Raja. The Raja has pressure from within his court, including the women of the court. That's the other important faction in any uh, princely state. The women are pretty strong in the palace. Then there are the noblemen below. They exert a different kind of pressure on the Raja. And finally, the people are not, you know, they're not without agency. It's not like the Raja chooses to oppress the people and the people just lie back getting oppressed. No, they had ways of countering the Raja if the Raja was a bad Raja. So there were peasant groups, there were tribal groups, you had to deal with all of them. So the Raja occupies a political ecosystem in which he has to, as you said, balance out uh, several groups. Now the romance between the Rajas and the Congress lasted as long as the Congress remained an elite armchair affair. 
the moment the Congress moved to mass politics, the moment it moved to rousing the masses for political change, the Rajas backed off because they realized that that formula could be used against them as well. You know, if, if today you have peasants in British district standing up to the local collector, tomorrow the same Jat peasants in your kingdom picking up the same strategy will stand up to you. That is where the Rajas start realizing that, hold on, maybe the Congress and us, this romance is culminating ultimately in a divorce because we are not looking for the same thing ultimately. So by the 1930s, as late as 1934, Gandhiji tells the Congress, uh, the younger men of the Congress, that you can't interfere in the princely states because they're autonomous. It's like interfering in Afghanistan or Afghanistan or Sri Lanka. So he still was re had reservations about interfering in the princely states. But the Raja starts slowly becoming repressive. The moment mass politics comes about in the princely states, the Rajas start shooting at their subjects, locking them up, basically becoming a version of the British themselves. Very few Rajas had the foresight to realize that actually this is the way history is going. We'd rather ride this wave than try and stand against it. And by the 1940s, many of them lost sympathy uh, you know, among their own people because there they were acts of violence. In Mysore, which was one of the most advanced princely states, there's something called the Viduraswata massacre, which was called the Jallianwala Bagh of the South. In Kerala, in Travancore, there's something called Punna Pravailar, where machine guns were used against communists who had emerged uh, in Kerala in the Travancore kingdom. So this kind of violence sort of cut the legitimacy the Rajas had enjoyed so far. That was one factor. The other was, as you said, you know, partition was looming. So if, if one part of the country is being chopped off, the Congress then had no incentive in allowing these autonomous units to continue. They wanted a strong center. They wanted unity, which meant the princely states had to go. Most of them fell in line. They were given their privy purses, etc. Some did not like Hyderabad, and there was, we like to use this very innocent term, police action, but it was actually military invasion. It was a military takeover. There was a, a commission afterwards called the Sundarlal Committee Report, which basically says that approximately between 25 to 40,000 people died following the Indian Army's uh, you know, takeover of Hyderabad. And Hyderabad, and, and look at how the Nizam had sort of arranged his cards, right? He was the premier Indian prince in India, the last representative of the Mughal order. He had got daughters-in-law who were related to the, Ottoman, the last Ottoman caliph. So he had international links in the Muslim world. He was seen as the natural leader of the Muslims of India, and he had a ton of money. So overall, the Nizam bet that, okay, I have, I have a shot at continuing independently, except that he was landlocked. He, if he had access to the sea, he may even have succeeded in great measure, but because he was landlocked, the plan went south, and Sadar Patel came in and, and took over. But he, in Patel himself, you know, we've now got the statue, Iron Man of India, the man who united India, and so on. In 1949, he refers to the princely states as ulcers, which can destroy India from within, sort of cannibalizes from within if they're allowed to continue. What's interesting is that 20 years before, in 1929, when he went to Mysore, some of the Mysore people were agitating against the Raja, and, and Sardar Patel said, you've got such a wonderful Raja. Your standard of living is much higher in Mysore. You've got industries, you've got schools, colleges, whatever. And if you're still criticizing your Raja, there's nothing wrong with the Raja. There's something wrong with you people. It's the same Sardar Patel whose tone changes completely 20 years later because the political landscape itself had completely changed. But what's interesting is, again, the book doesn't argue that the Rajas were good or bad. The book just says they were politically interesting, and therefore they need to be studied seriously, and not just as people who watch dan Dancing Girls and wild away their time counting diamonds. No, that's, that's so very important because, you know, again, it, it goes back to what I started our discussion with, that we have to forsake this eulinear approach that we have. And, I mean, history is primarily about complexities and layers. And that's something that we sort of uh, digress from so easily, which is not the right thing to do. And that's where I think your book is such a telling comment and such an amazingly interesting narrative. I would I, really request... Uh, do we have time, though? Is it... No, no, we're doing good. No, Don't I, worry. When you mentioned complexity, I remember that I hadn't spoken at all about the women in the book. No, I was uh, going to refer to that because I wanted to come in and say that, you know, particularly because we are focusing a lot on some of the southern states and where, you know, matrilineal uh, equations are so strong. And it's also reflected so beautifully in Ravi Varma's paintings because, you know, so many of these women of the royal family, including his own, yeah. because if I'm not wrong, two of his granddaughters were uh, part of the royalty. They became uh, part of the royal family. You know, it's uh, amazing to see how these women are portrayed as such strong people. And I found one particular painting, which is there in the book also. I hadn't seen that before I saw your book. 
you know, where this woman, she's attired completely in the traditional sari and the traditional exquisite South Indian jewelry, etc. But her hair, it's done in this completely French pattern where she has this roll on top of her forehead. So it's so fascinating to see how these women are being portrayed again as a combination of modernity and tradition. So please comment on that. You know, that the, the princely women, what's interesting is again, this whole cliche that they were all locked up in zananas where they were either crying and weeping because their husbands were not paying them attention or they were plotting and intriguing against all the men in their lives. That's the cliche the British put out. But in reality, the harem was also a political institution. Women in the harem had their own lands. They were, the institution may have been framed in a patriarchal structure, but women still found ways to subvert it. They always have. No matter where you lock up uh, women in patriarchal structures, they will still use it to their, turn it to their advantage in some way or the other. So, you know, uh, Parda, for example, we think that all these women were in Parda, they had no access to men. There was a queen in Jaipur. Her son became the Maharaja when he was a little boy, so she was the regent of, of Jaipur. She had no issues meeting with the male members of her own darbar, trusted ministers, trusted uh, Say you know, like Rani of Jhansi. I mean, she would meet her darbar very yeah. regularly. It wasn't a big deal. You know, often there were rituals for this. For example, I mean, it's, it's slightly strange now that we think of it. In the Deccan Sultanates, there was this queen. She fed some of her breast milk to a minister and said, now you're like my son, therefore no parda with you. So there were mechanisms by which strangers could be admitted into the, into the parda system as well. In Jaipur, this queen is interesting. She has no issues with Parda with her own men. The moment the British resident says he, he wants to come and see her, she says, no, 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 Parda, Parda, Parda. I will not meet the British resident. So Parda becomes an excuse to keep the Englishman out and her own court in. It's an interesting strategy. And eventually the British resident leaves because he realizes what this lady is trying to do. Then you take a case of Maharani Jamna Bai of Baroda. It's one of the most colorful characters in the book. She's such a striking figure. 13-year-old girl, she's picked up from a village uh, near, near Rahimatpur in Maharashtra and told that, you know, Maharaja of Baroda, married twice before, has no children, so he's going to try a third time with a new wife. So 13-year-old gets married to a 38-year-old man. They don't have children. And then at the age of, when she's about 17 years old, the Raja dies. Next in line is his brother, who's a confirmed villain, tries to poison people, you know, kidnaps women, complete stereotype of a bad prince. This girl, she doesn't quietly go into the zanana. There's this uh, statement from an English official from the 1880s where he, looking at multiple cases across princely India, he says that, you know, whenever a Raja dies without heirs, it's funny that his, suddenly, the moment he's died, so many of his queens become pregnant. And it's exactly what this Jamna Bai also does. Suddenly, all these years she's had, in these five, six years of marriage, she's had no pregnancy. Now the Raja dies at the age of 17, she says, oh, I'm actually with child. Her brother-in-law, who's next in line, he knows what she's playing at. He suspects that it has nothing to do with his brother, and even the pregnancy might be bogus. Turns out the pregnancy is real, which means now you have to wait and see if she gives birth to a boy or a girl. So there's this vendetta between the two of them. He tries to send her fruit baskets where the fruit is injected with poison. She throws the fruit basket out, starts cooking her own food, sleeping with a dog tied to her bed with a dagger in her hand. Ultimately, she leaves the palace, goes to the British agent's house, and gives birth there because she thinks the Raja will harm her. The Raja is not an idiot either. He follows her into the British resident's house, and as she's giving birth, he stands outside the door to make sure the baby isn't swapped, a, boy, a girl replaced with a boy. It turns out to be a girl. Raja succeeds. Again, this girl, she's all of 18 years old, refuses to go away quietly. Instead of going into the Baroda Palace Zenana, she exits to Pune, which is in the Bombay presidency. Pune is where all the new Maharashtrian politicians are. That's where the press is centered, the Marathi press. She's got all her jewelry with her. What does she do? She starts investing this jewelry in anti-Maharaja propaganda. So she basically sells the jewelry, takes the money, and gives it to people in Baroda saying, go complain against your Maharaja to the British agent. Then she manipulates the British resident, his own subordinates. She starts bribing them with money to fan animosity with her brother-in-law. So the brother-in-law is bad. He's not a good ruler, but he's sort of being cheated in a sense, because the Rani is sitting in Pune and making sure the British hate him and his own subjects constantly keep complaining against him because she's funding all these complaints. Four or five years pass, he's finally kicked off the throne and she comes back. In triumph, she comes back to Baroda. And now she forms an alliance with the British. The next in line is a 28-year-old man. British say he's too old, we won't be able to control him. Rani also says he's too old, I'm only 20 years old, I won't be able to control him either. She's 23, I guess. Uh, so what they do is they exile him to Banaras, they look into the Baroda royal family's family tree, find one 12-year-old boy who's the right age, which means he's not formed an opinion yet, he can be controlled by others, he's a kid. 
So they go all the way out to a place near Nasik, pick up this 12-year-old boy from a farm. He's working on a farm, can't read or write, he's illiterate. He's picked up from there, plonked on the throne of Baroda as the next king. And for the next five years, he's bombarded with lessons. The British are bombarding him with lessons on how to be loyal to the British. Rani's bombarding him with lessons on how to be loyal to her. Ultimately, he proves loyal to neither, and you know, she ends up losing power. But it's interesting that for a good 12 years, this woman knew exactly how to operate. She was not royalty. She came from an obscure family, from a village. At the age of 17, starting with her pregnancy till this adopted son grows up, she retains very much power, a, a lot of power in Baroda, and she's very much a key player in the Baroda court, all officially from behind Parda. But even that parda was constantly negotiable. When the Prince of Wales visited India, she went to Bombay to see him. When he came to Baroda Palace, she didn't keep parda. In fact, there's a wonderful reference with one of the prince's companions saying that, oh, you know, she had the most beautiful toe ring on and she had such nice arms and feet. And you know, th th these, these observations about her. And the best is there's a striking portrait of her where you look at her and she's radiating such personality and such force, like she's glaring at the viewer from the painting. Because in a sense, she's communicating that I'm not a nobody. You know, it's not like I am some coy, pavam lady who's supposed to sit in the harem quietly and chant bhajans because my husband died. No, I'm going to make a bid for power. I may lose, but I'm a political actor. And that is what you see with all these, these, these women, even when they're in Parda, even when the odds are against them. Uh, that's phenomenal. And we have so much to learn from the women who are there at that point of time. I'll take it on with questions now, but I'll pose the first question before I, I open it out. To, and I've been posing questions to you for more than 40 minutes now, but still, I'm going to pose the first question, Manu, because, uh, I mean, considering you're someone so young. Not anymore. You know, you are. I mean, look at me. I mean, in contrast to me, you are. So I'm just... I think after 30, everything is the same. Oh, Makes you no think difference. so? <laughs> no, but uh, you've already written four books. And um, my question is very simple. What prompted you to start writing books? I mean, considering, you know, you were a student and you're so steeped in academia, what prompted you to start writing books? I think just the stories that are so compelling, right? We, as you said, right at the start of this session, we have a tendency to think of history as this very dull, boring affair with five dates, five empires, three sultans, five kings, that's it. That's Indian history for you. But just the story of the women I described, there's so many layers to it, you know. Officially, they are oppressed by patriarchy, and yet look at how they flout it, yet look at how they wield power. Similarly, the legends, the comedy, the, the just life that there is in Indian history. Who ultimately makes history? It is human beings. And human beings then and today are complicated beings. We have strengths, we had weaknesses, we are capable of naughty things, we are capable of good things. All of this existed even in the past. If you start looking at the past not as some alien planet, but as just another ecosystem of human beings, just in a different context, it comes alive in a completely different way. And the stories to me were just fascinating. You know, I, um, uh, one example I like to give often is, because it, it, it sort of rings, uh, it, it rings with the audience, is, you know, in Kerala, where I come from, it was, the norm was toplessness. You know, everybody walked about topless, men and women. It was only with the coming of the British that the idea that women's bodies have to be covered up a certain way, that came into, into vogue. And I remember uh, the story... Uh, it's the same for Bengal. I mean, women, they were clad in saris, but there was no, no concept blouse. of a blouse. Yeah. yeah. In fact, the blouse was seen as a Western bad thing. Very you know? much. Like, <laughs> you didn't wear... Men, when they went out to college and came back, before they entered the house, they had to take off their shirts, go take a dip in the pond, and then come and eat, because the shirt was considered brushed. You couldn't wear it. It was the same for women. And I have a wonderful story my grandmother told me about how her mother, my great-grandmother, she was in her 40s at her second daughter's wedding. The, the bridegroom's family brought her a blouse as a gift. It was called a rauka. And by then, blouses had started becoming common. And she went and bore this blouse for the first time. And she was admiring herself in the mirror. And somebody said, oh, why don't you step out now? Let everybody see you in your fancy new blouse. And she said, no, no, no. If, how can I go out in a blouse in front of my father and my, my brothers and so on? What will they think of me? You know, a good cultured woman does not wear a blouse. <laughs> so blouses were seen as something very strange and unusual. The British had this, uh, they, they used to go to the Maharaja of Travancore's palace, where all the female staff used to walk around topless. And the British residents said, Maharaja, this is not appropriate. They must wear blouses. So the Maharaja issued an order. All women in the palace wear blouses. The moment they walked out of the palace gate, the first thing they removed was the blouse because they could not be known in public as blouse-wearing women because that was something wrong. It was something seen as very 
unusual for women. So see to how the equation has just changed completely today. That's, what, that, that's the thing, right? So history yeah. is not what we think it is. Yeah. Our idea of tradition is often moderated by our own preoccupations, by our own conditioning, by our own sense of what we today value. That's how we. That's the lens through which we look at the past. In reality, the past exists on its own terms. And if you start looking at Indian history on its own terms, it becomes lively. It becomes rich and far from black and white. It's just exceedingly colorful. Colorful, like a mosaic, plenty of colors, no dearth of you know liveliness. I'm so glad that you put it so beautifully because you know, ultimately it's all the art of storytelling and how good the storyteller is. And I'm I can assure you, you're one of the best. So let's hope that we can uh, have many more coming out from you. We'll take questions now. So uh, if uh, we could just pass on the mic, yes, the gentleman there. Uh, my question to Manu is that, Manu, this is a very unfortunate observation that in this country, if someone talks much about Hindu mythology, he is immediately branded as Hindu fundamentalist. It happened with Anantapai for the Amar Chitra Katha. It happened with Gita Press of Gorakhapur, everybody. Now, while working on Ravi Verma, definitely Ravi Verma is a painter of the royal families, but his uh, pan-India popularity is only because of painting Hindu mythological god and goddess. And he practically dominated the time, calendars, matchbox, posters, everything. I just want to know, while studying on Ravi Burma, do you think a great artist like him had any hidden agenda in his mind anywhere that by his painting, his expression, will somehow establish his religious fundamentalism somewhere? Or thinking Ravi Burma, a painter of fundamental man who is painting Hindu mythological painting is a very notorious left-leaning idea. You Please know, comment. I, I actually addressed this in the introduction to the book, which is that firstly, the, so the world in which Ravi Varma operated, he actually traveled through India trying to find inspiration. Firstly, he found that all the temple sculpture showed women topless in the Victorian age, you couldn't do that. So he's, he comes up with Lakshmi, Saraswati, Parvati as high-necked, blouse-wearing, modern, sari-wearing women. To us, they now look traditional. In his time, they were actually very modern. A lot of people found it objectionable that he was dressing his goddesses this way. All the goddesses were fair-skinned because fair skin was, again, very much a colonial uh, you know, idea that we had picked up. But there's this lovely painting of his mother-in-law in the book where he, she's yeah. not fair-skinned at all. I yeah. mean, that is also a very telling comment, it I is, think. It is. No, but you know, on, on the point of the mythology, in fact, there were friends of his. There was a man called Sir T. Madhav Rao, one of the great statesmen of the 19th century. He's the one who first suggested to Ravi Varma that you depict scenes from the epics, you depict scenes from Sanskrit literature. Yes, locally people have diversity, different languages, different food habits, and I quote in the book, different bathing styles also. There was no uniformity. But the one common passion across India was the epics, was the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. So if you give that a visual imagery, suddenly everybody, no matter what language they speak, no matter where they are, they will all be able to relate to it. Because everybody's heard of Sita, everybody's heard of Draupadi. I mean, in Kerala, among the Muslims, there's something called a Mapla Ramayana, where Shurpanakha comes in and, and courts Rama and says that, and when Rama says he's got a wife already, Shurpanakha says, that's fine, the Sharia allows you to take a second wife, you know. Even among the Muslims of Kerala, the Ramayana existed in a different form. So that is why he decided that, you know, urged on by these friends of his, Sati Madhurao, there was a governor of Bombay, an Englishman, who said that the epics are your national imagery, you know. That very much it was considered not a Hindu thing, but very much a nationalist thing, what they were trying to build at that time. Since then, of course, equations have changed. In fact, the moment Ravi Varma died, we're sitting in Calcutta, the Bengal school unseated him, saying that he had followed Western styles and so on, and therefore, uh, he was just an imitator. He was just a copy uh, cat, as it were. He was not actually an innovative figure, etc., etc. And for many, many, many years, he was off the fashionable, uh, you know, artistic catalogs or whatever. It was only in the 80s and 90s people again started engaging with him, and you started realizing that there was more to the story uh, than meets the eye. But yeah, I, I don't think he went in thinking he was creating anything religious. I think he went in thinking that this would actually urge the nationalism, uh, the, the process of nationalism and its evolution in India. There was a question from this boy here. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Pillai, my question to you is essentially about Ravi Varma and his style of painting. So, we all know about Ravi Varma's Indo-European style of painting and also how later, uh, especially in the 1930s, it was sort of neglected by the nationalists because of the fact that he infused the European style of painting into the, uh, into the Indian style and it was influenced by that. My question to you essentially is that, in today's age, 
when nationalism has become such a polemical concept, when it is pretty much like a hot potato, which is very similar to the time that existed during the 1930s and the 1940s. Do you think another Ravi Varma, with his same kind of European, uh, Indo-European style of painting, could he have existed or would he still be rejected by the so-called nationalists or even by the ruling dispensation for that matter? I think we have, I mean, we've moved beyond that style in great measure because, you know, people have discovered that, I mean, Amrita Shergal came in and she saw the Ajanta paintings and said, these are the greatest art, this is the greatest art India has ever produced. She was not very impressed with Ravi Varma, she was impressed by what came before. I think the quarrel really is when people argue that revivalism is the only way to establish national pride. The thing is, revivalism assumes that somehow there was original art, and that was like a rock, it was well-shaped, and you just have to revive it. In reality, all art is constantly evolving. It's always drawing from other things, it's always drawing from multiple influences. For example, there's this painting of Saraswati that was uh, patronized and commissioned by Ibrahim Adil Shah, the Sultan of Bijapur. He was a big bhakt of Saraswati and Ganapati. If you look at the painting at one glance, it looks like an, an Islamic painting from Persia. The clothes, the woman's appearance, all of that. But you look closely and you see all the emblems of Saraswati, the conch, the veena, all of that exists, which is him using a Persian style to depict the Saraswati of his mind. Now, would you say this is not Indian art because it's Persian? No, it's considered very much a part of Indian art. So too with Ravi Varma, he borrows the Indo-European style and then applies it to Indian subjects. Today we've moved, people have different schools, different styles of painting, many of them are inspired by Ajanta, they're inspired by the Pahadi tradition, they're inspired by the company school in, in, in Madras, for example, has a completely different style. So I think in today's world we've sort of moved beyond that conversation. It isn't one dominating form of national art, it's more about celebrating all kinds of art that exist on equal terms. So there's no high and low as to what is good art and what is bad art. So long as it's authentic, so long as it comes from our culture, our experiences, it's all welcome, I think. One more question. They've given us the signal. So the girl here, right here. Uh, hi. I actually wanted to ask that, you know, in most of these southern states as well, there was a lot of caste uh, issues at play, especially in Kerala and uh, um, Karnataka, I think. There was this elitism of, and there was a lot of oppression as well. I mean, you have instances where women have cut off their breasts to make a statement. So, if we talk about uh, Indian Rajas empowering their administration, why didn't they think of empowering the people by kind of removing the caste system or the class system then? You see, it was always a push and pull between traditional forms of power and structure and Western ideas, you know, which is, frankly, that's what Gandhiji also wanted to do. He didn't want to wholesale import a Western model and impose it on India. He thought it has to be shaped in consonance with Indian ideals and values, including, in his case, caste. You know, he was not against Varna. And, and a lot of the Rajas always had this sort of love-hate relationship with modernity in the sense that a Raja would not allow a Dalit into temples, but he would set up modern schools and say, okay, fine, in these schools, Dalits may go because uh, this we are willing to accept because it's a new institution. So you're not tampering with tradition, you're creating something new and you're saying this is fine. The problem is, and most Rajas realize this eventually, or rather very quickly, is that you can't actually bifurcate society between these two things, saying, okay, here everybody's welcome equally, here everybody's not welcome. Which is why in Mysore, in Travancore, all these progressive princely states, if you look at their local politics, it all revolved around caste. In Mysore, it was the Lingayats and the Okaligas, which is even now in Karnataka politics, these are the two big caste groupings. In Travancore, it was the Nayas, the Iravas, and the Christians. These were the three big uh, dominant political groups. Because politics then started, be became the platform through which caste reform could, could be, uh, you know, could be, could be orchestrated because the Raja, after the goodness of his heart, would never do it. Ultimately, as I said, you know, Rajas did not care for their subjects in some altruistic way. They cared for their subjects so long as it would help them hold on to their power as well. They were political beings, just as politicians today like to cling to power. They would adapt and change to the extent their power was preserved. So if it became fashionable, so Maharaj of Travancore 1936 allows Dalits into temples for the first time. It was not out of the goodness of his heart. It was because the Irava community threatened to convert to another religion, and he was very conscious of his state as a Hindu state. So if 25% of your subjects overnight become something else, you're no longer a Hindu state. So then he had no option but to uh, have what was called the temple entry proclamation. So everything is a push and pull, and I think it's not about the Rajas giving anything to the people. Their subjects were able to snatch it from them over time. I think ultimately power was with the people even in a princely state. The Rajas could delay the process, but ultimately they had to bow to changing public opinion. That's why they were wiped out by the end of it. Uh, 
thank you very much and I think this gentleman deserves a big hand not only for the session today but also our best wishes from the City of Joy that thank you. you're going to write more books for us and Fingers keep uh, this huge storytelling trend alive so that young people and also uh, anyone, I mean, they really get to read more of what our past is all about. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. Thank you to the audience and thank you for the wonderful questions. I Thanks. hope we didn't run over time. Yes, we I did, think I'm we've sorry. done well <laughs> and thank you Kolkata Literary Meet and thank you Malavika Banerjee you for again. always thank having you. us here. Thank you. Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet Porir J session Hote Choleche Sheta Adhapak Shukanta Jodhuri Bhoi Bhasha Ortho O Shotoni Alechona Thakbin Shemonti Ghosh Ami Onushtan Shuru Rage Amade Bokta De Akta Chotokore Porizi the Edite Jodio Era Porizi Dabi Rakhena Hubu Boli Shukanta